Hi, my name is Ava Grace Tobias. My great grandfather was Joseph Mulhern. He served he served in World War II and flew the B twenty nine. Joseph was a SAS sergeant in the sixty first Squadron, thirty ninth Bomb Group, and twentieth Air Force. My great grandpa was in command of the gunner crew of the B twenty nine. He flew one special mission at the end of the war, and that is what the story is about. First, let me give some background info on the plane. The Boeing B-29 Superfortress is an American four-engined propeller-driven heavy bomber designed by Boeing and flown primarily in the United States during World War II and the Korean War. Named in allusion to its predecessor, the B-17 Flying Fortress, the Superfortress was designed for high-altitude strategic bombing but also excelled in low-altitude night incendiary bombing and in dropping naval mines to blockade Japan. B-29s dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the only ever aircraft to drop nuclear weapons in combat. One of the largest aircraft of World War II, the B-29 was designed with state-of-the-art technology, which included a pressurized cabin, dual-wheeled tricycle landing gear, and an analog computer controlled fire control system that allowed one gunner and a fire control officer to direct four remote machine gun turrets. The three billion dollar cost of the design and production far exceeding the 1.9 billion cost of the Manhattan Project made the B-29 program the most expensive of the war. My great-grandfather flew on the day the Japanese surrendered to the Allies. The radio operator on the plane was named Staff Sergeant Jack, Jack Daughtery. What I'm about to read you is a letter from Sergeant Daughtery. The letter includes the thoughts of a 25-year-old B-29 radio operator who at the time had little knowledge of the Japanese people and their culture. What you're about to hear next is the first-hand report from Sergeant Daughtery. Hello, folks. Well, it looks as though things are settled for now for good. God only knows. I hope so. It's certainly remarkable how our country could turn out such a war machine from scratch. I guess it just proves how flexible a force and democratic nation can be. Now, if this piece can be only made to stick, all of this won't have been wasted. The day the piece was signed, I was lucky enough to be over Tokyo. We flew, we flew a colonel and some newsreel men over to see the show. More than likely, You'll see some of the pictures in the movie houses at home. We spent three to four hours flying over Tokyo and vicinity, most of the time being spent at an altitude between 200 and 600 feet. That trip was one thing I wouldn't have missed for anything and will probably never forget as long as I live. I can imagine some people would have spent plenty of money to take such a sightseeing trip by air on that eventful day. Our trip to the Empire was uneventful as usual, and we hit the shore of Japan about six in the morning and came to a landfall over a long series of fishing villages. We went down pretty low to have a look and give them a little scare. Along the beach, people were lined up about every 50 yards, hauling fish nets by hand. There seemed to be about 50 or 60 people to a line, and it made me wonder how people used such primitive methods could wage a war on the scale that they did. As we flew over them, some broke and ran while others waved hats and white cloths. However, don't think this was in the way of greeting. Most of them just stood and stared. We were low enough to get a good look at the homes and surroundings and can't say too much for them. The houses are built close together and look old and weather-beaten. Paint seems unknown to them, and the streets of the town seem to have no planning or arrangement at all. From there, we swung southeast toward Tokyo. We flew over some camps and airfields, but most of them seemed deserted. Lots of planes were in evidence, but were all shot up and could hardly be called planes. The runways were shot to hell, too. Most of this type of bombing was done by the Navy fighters and dive bombers. The country itself is very green and picturesque, and every available piece of ground was cultivated. I even saw a garden on the top, the very top of a mountain. None of the ground was surveyed and was laid out very irregular. Shortly we came to Tokyo. 
At first, I didn't even know we were over the city. It seemed as though we were flying over a desert or a wasteland. Mile after mile, the city was nothing but raised ground, and not even walls or fireplaces were in evidence. The center of the city was still standing, but only because it was made of steel and concrete. However, most of the buildings were gutted and burned out. It was like staring at Darby and leveling everything down to the ground until you ran into the 30th Street Post Office and then only leaving the larger and better built buildings. It was incredible to see just what these boys in the B-29s had accomplished. We flew over the palace a few times and gave it a good once over. It's one of the largest and tallest buildings in the city and was practically untouched, but only because it had been missed on purpose. In general, the city was an utter ruin and had ceased to be a large city. Unless some miracles of building are brought about it, and it will take generations to build up again. There wasn't much signs of life around. A few street cars were running and occasionally Jap army truck was seen on the street. Most of the people were on foot and several bicycles were in evidence. We saw one train about six cars heading for the country. It stopped at a station in the city that was jammed with people trying to get out of the city. I knew they all couldn't have gotten in. I saw two or three PW camps right in Tokyo proper. Two of them had signs made on the ground and roof. All of them read, Drop outside, thanks a lot. And the other said, Come back and get us. For the past week or so, B-29s have been flying up and dropping supplies to the PW camps. They've flown a lot of equipment up there. I guess some of the poor guys really needed it. The Navy was much was very much in evidence, and there were ships of all classes in the bay, with small landing aircraft shuttling back and forth between the lands and ships. My guess is that they were bringing out prisoners. A Jap battleship and carrier were in bay, all shot to hell and resting on the bottom. All shipping was in ruin, and even the small barges and sampans had gotten a good going over. All in, All in all, the flight gave a terrific picture of the superiority we had gained in the last year or so in this theater. It, is seem, it seems unbelievable that the Japanese people could have held out as long as they did. Even without the atomic bomb, the ruin brought on by the B-29 would have gone in, on increase, in increasing fury, with little or no opposition. It will be a long day before the Japs forget the completeness of their defeat, and if they have one descent decent mind and power, they'll never attempt another war. Their industry is almost wiped out with proper allied control. Their war-making potential could easily be done away with. So much for that trip. It was quite a thrill and one to be remembered. I was damned lucky to be able to make the trip and suppose I'm one of the lucky fellows in this war, for I certainly escaped the horror of it.